what I, what I liked about this interview so far is a lot of the sharing that's happening, but how you've been able to weave like stories and uh, teachings that you've you've heard in the past, and you're bringing these forward at, at the expense of sounding repetitious, uh, because you have you have shared some stories, but. Um, your your grandson happens to be here, which kind of really leads into this question about what stories or teachings do you want to make sure gets carried on to him and that he could pass on down the road. It's the, the kind of thought that's carried in the language that becomes important because it's through your language that you immerse yourself in your own culture. You don't you rely on uh, another language coming from another culture to uh, describe yourself and uh, relate to the world that you are coming from. So if you are able to think in your language, which you mean my language, my it's Anishinaabemowin. There is a uh, a way of seeing and a way of being inside the language, which is innate within the language that uh, makes it difficult at times for people to come to know Be especially if you're coming from that uh, modern scientific world you um, find challenge in leaving that world and coming into the world of being an Ishnabic because you're having to put away the physical dimension of what that uh, wage economic world, that western science world is coming from and people who are there, this is um, the challenge that they have are having to overcome. So in, I used the example of the translation of the baby term. So when you talk about baby in English, you say baby. You grew up in the language, you live in that culture. You, under, you understand, okay, that there's something about uh, an infant a young child, a baby that's uh, innate within the word, but it's an object focused, okay, way of thought, way of uh, way of seeing, way of living. Mm -hmm. And when we take the term and translate the term baby into an Ishnabic way of uh, being, you put a bigger dimension to what the baby is. Mm -hmm. okay. When you say Abanoji is the term that we use to describe what a baby is about. And when you just say baby, um, we say Abanoji. Abanoji, uh, making and framing that word, has pieces that are brought together. Example would be the first part of that, ah, that's the explanation that there's spirit here very much a part of what this little infant is there's a spiritual dimension to that child it's not an object it's a spirit being okay abe says it's uh, it uh, doesn't move when it's first born it can't move on its own it's dependent on someone providing for its care but oje abin Okay. Ben says this little spirit is coming into this world. It comes from a spiritual world realm and it enters into this physical space. Now you're getting into the world of the Western science mind. Okay. When you say a Ben, it comes into mm -hmm. a space that we are born into, which is a physical place. Mm -hmm. And that's what um, the understanding is. You come from the spirit, where, did you, where were you before? Well, there's an answer. Say, well, the the child was here before, but it wasn't in the form of this infant baby. It was here as a spirit being. Mm -hmm. But when life came, the spirit from that larger outside world suddenly was put into this little vessel of this little infant body, and now it's here in that form. But it's connected still with that wider realm of relationship, and it hasn't split off in any way. It's connect directly connected. But we, 
and trying to wrap our eyes around and our head around this kind of a, a way of seeing, it makes it a, a challenge to want to accept because you're wanting to say, well, prove that to me. You want to see validation like we do in science for what you are describing. And for our people, they say it's just understood. When we think about the vastness of the universe, the placement of the stars. Okay. So when you look at the twinkling star in the sky, okay, we say, Nongos. Okay, Nongosak. The vastness of the quantity of them. Small. But they're out there and they're filled with spirit. Okay. And you don't know that these are physical objects, some of them being quite larger than our own sun. Okay, a thousand times bigger. Some of them, when they look at, think about what they are, and science tells us that they're, that they're there. Mm -hmm. But we say, well, some of them are so far away, we don't even know if they're still there. But the light that came from it is still traveling here to get here. Right, right. Okay, so that is difficult to understand, to explain. So when we think about um, the way of seeing, the way, the, way the, the way that we relate to the world, is a different view. And that's what, that's what becomes important. That's what makes Anishinaabek distinct from other nations of, and other peoples of the world. It's that, uh, the way it's described today, let's say it's our, uh, uh, the word is slipping my mind, but it's our culture, okay? It's our world view, okay? That makes us different. Mm -hmm. And Western science today finds challenge in wanting to accept our view as being somewhat real and legitimate. It wants to put us in a lower form, a lesser form, and say, well, don't uh, make those kinds of assessments. Don't do that kind of, uh, of uh, that kind of labeling. There's nothing inferior, it's just an alternative way of seeing. And acknowledge that. It's just a different way to look. But inside, what it does, it creates a different society. And the society that you create is what we see the early explorers writing about. Inside the society, the poverty is not there. Hmm? Because poverty is something that never came. Hmm? So if it never was there, you don't even know what it is. They don't have a word to describe what it is. Mm -hmm. hmm? Similarly, when we talk about uh, possession of the land, and this is what uh, inside that treaty we look to, we, were, we just came through a court case and the big challenge in the court case was trying to translate the first part of what the treaty language is saying. You see words in there, cede, surrender, transfer title, convey, that's all property language object focused thinking. But we can't translate those ideas in those the opening phrases into it's not possible because the IDs don't exist. And yet, we have this treaty which talks about our transferring over to Great Britain title and land. We say we can give you permission to come and walk on the land, but we can't give you a title to the property. Mm -hmm. So when we ask today, by the standards which are now in place, there's this uh, what they call the UNDRIP, United Nations Recognition of Indigenous Peoples' Rights, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, and they're wanting to put a uh, a piece of legislation through the House of Commons accepting UNDRIP. That's fine to uh, accept UNDRIP. But UNDRIP is limited. It doesn't go to the step that's needing to be taken. The acknowledgement of us as a nation. Mm -hmm. 
That's what the treaty provides for. The treaty provides for our acknowledgement and our existence assessment and our accommodation as being a nation. Canada has to admit that. And it doesn't want to do so because suddenly it puts itself into this position of uh, having to sit down and get consent from us before it does anything. Mm -hmm. And it talks about it doesn't want to have a limited small body of people and people having veto over Canada's constitution. So that creates problems for Canada. But Canada can't get around. It has to sit down because that's what the law provides for. So when we deal with teaching our children, we're having to teach them about these abstract concepts, about who they are, what they have, what they're able to enjoy in being an Ishnabic. Mm. And we have to take time to teach them what that means and what that is, mm -hmm. and the way that I was able to be informed by my parents so that it doesn't become lost and you don't lose your house. Saying, I have to take care of my house. This is your house. It's your responsibility to look after it. Yeah. Creator put you here in this part of the world for you to enjoy. He didn't put you in Africa. He didn't put you in Asia. He didn't put you in Europe. He put you here in North America, in Turtle Island. Yeah. This is a place that you are able to enjoy. You can say, this is my home. So when we want, to have our, we want our children to enjoy that comfort, of knowing that, mm -hmm. and that it's up to them to, to make those determinations about how they're going to choose to live, but we want to make it secure for them so that future generations are possible, mm -hmm. that they can dream about being able to have those pleasures. So it's going to take us some time to, uh, to do that work. So my grandson, it's important that he uh, sees himself from the perspective of being positive, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm able to share with him go outside and put tobacco in the fire, go down to the lake and put some, uh, catch a little little frog, not to kill him, but to look at him and put him back in the water, little things like, which are so meaningful for the children when they're growing up, and I was able to do that with my own children, I watched them on the dock to catch the little fish, fill up the little bucket, see who caught the most, put them back in the water, the next day go back and do the same thing again, the yeah. pleasure of being a child. And that's what my Brandon, when he came home, he cried. Okay, he went out to the lake because he missed that mm. when he moved away for a time. Right. He brought tears to his eyes, the memories of how much fun it was to be able to do that as a child. I like that, uh, that idea about you had said to dream about. A good lead into the, into the question about what is your vision for an Ishnavic education over the next 10 years then? I think it's to change the curriculum. To get Canada to accept that the Anishinaabek people have a rightful place in their own home and that we are in relationship with Canada that's unique, distinct. So within Canada we don't fear the idea of there being Anishinaabek people here. So it's like going across Canada. When I leave Ontario, I go into Manitoba. When I leave Manitoba, I go into Saskatchewan. When I leave across the country, you're in different provinces, but they're all within Canada. Or if you're in Sudbury, you're in Ontario, but you're still in Canada. There's no fear about that. It has a lot to do with how the administration is put into place, acknowledging and supporting rather than trying to get rid of and, uh, and dump so there's a need for Canada to open up its mind and to open up its uh, way of living to um, accommodate what the reality is, that they're in the home of the Anishinaabek. And there's a treaty there that confirms and makes that happen. Just uh, live with it and um, teach it and enjoy it. There's not to, nothing, to, nothing to be feared, but it has a lot to do with successful cohabitation. The partnership living in there. We talk about uh, in our language. We talk about um, or we talk about having relatives, and we say all of my relations. Well, my relations include not only people, but there are animals, life forms, plants, animals, rock, water. It's a different way of looking, 
and we have responsibility to uh, ensure that those relatives are also going to be able to exist. See, the water will be pure, salt water and fresh water. Trees will have a habitat. Animals will have a habitat. Although those change with the uh, changing populations, but there's a an awareness of each one having um, the ideas about right to exist. Mm. Mm. And we have obligation to manage what those responsibilities are in the best way that we are, we are able. So it's a different way to look at uh, what we are needing to do as our work. Do so in a way which is going to be responsible and loving toward your neighbor. So in terms of the ch my children, it's getting that Anishinaabeg education. Mm. That's what it amounts to. Not to fear it, but to uh, look at it as being a prize to be enjoyed. When uh, you had brought up uh, the need to change the curriculum, there's the uh, Anishinaabeg education initiative that's happened. There was a vote to uh, to move forward with this this education system. Is uh, implementation of something like this feasible in like a ten year period, or is does there something else have to accompany this to achieve your 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 ten year kind of goal? I guess the achieving of the of the goal requires Canada to shift the way that it currently operates. It's having to open up its its mind its political system, to accept what has been produced by historical agreement. It's running away from those responsibilities, in my view. Mm. And that's what the old people um, indicate, and you know, I've said, Canada, it's time for you to sit down and uh, own up to your uh, obligations. So when you go back and learn that history, for me it's very clear, because it's what I use when I sit down with Canada on occasion to remind them about I'm not coming out of the dark, I'm not coming out of somewhere that's unknown, it's coming from clear, defined pathway milestones. And we are at a time now, 1850, and we've just come to a court case, and this court case has said there's an obligation upon Canada and Ontario to increase the annuity payment that's due to the Anishinaabeg. Why did we have to take us a hundred and some odd years to go into court to have a court say to Canada that they're failing miserably in upholding their side of the bargain. Mm -hmm. And are we going to go to another 10 years, 50 years, 20 years of time before Canada tr sits down and actually does something that's required of them, legally requires them to follow through with obligations that were entered into on in healthy relationship uh, living? I think it uh, shouldn't. We shouldn't have to go to court. It's just um, unthinkable that you take your own nation to court in order to get some kind of a uh, of an outcome that's going to be meaningful. How do we uh, get Canada to move? It's like uh, a little child that's abused in the schoolyard. When there's a say a grade eight student taking the lunch money from the kindergarten child, the kindergarten child really cannot defend themselves. But that does not make it legally right or morally right that the grade 8 student can steal the money, lunch money. That's the kind of relationship that we find ourselves today in, in terms of how we relate with Canada. It's like, and I, this is what I say very clearly, I say we are bullied by, by Canada. And that's uh, sad, but it doesn't uh, make it go away, it doesn't make it right. But Canada p tries to pressure and tries to uh, make extinct, makes uh, tries to erase those obligations. So when we sit with Canada, we're having to be very careful. And this is something that uh, we encountered when Canada was um, going through this idea of patriating the Constitution. When we went to Great Britain to object to Canada's acting alone, because it was 
going to produce a document that ignored our people. Canada cried and tried to stop our delegation from going to Britain to sit and get an audience with the British Crown and the British government. And they did everything to try and stifle that process. But our people said, no, it's not for you to interfere in. It's not for you to stop. So our people went to Great Britain and we were able to get an audience with the House of Lords, which is for them the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court of Great Britain, and the House of Lords said to our people very clear, we have ties with you, formed by treaty. When we pass authority for Canada to make law under its system of government, modeled on our style of government, we didn't erase you. We didn't rub you out. We pass obligation on to Canada to complete and follow through with its obligations that we made with you. So when we look at Section 109, it talks about agreements made by Great Britain before Confederation and how those con agreements have to be carried on in Confederation after Confederation occurs. And it also references back to the Royal Proclamation. It says in the Royal Proclamation, this is law that gave Canada the route to which it came into existence. And again inside there, it says before we come on to your land, we will first make a treaty with you. And it's not something they want to force on you. It's at your request that we make the treaty. So Canada can't force its way into the land, onto the land, into the territory, into the homes, and try to wipe out the inheritance that we have, which is the title to the land. Mm -hmm. So it's important that that be understood. So when we sit down with Canada today, Canada's Constitution, and that Section 35, it says inside the document that we will not abrogate or derogate the treaty. The treaty is entrenched in the Constitution as primary law. Canada can't just arbitrarily come out and try to uh, eradicate it. Mm. It can't do that. It has to, in order to do that, it has to open up the treaty. Canada doesn't want to go there. Because suddenly we're more informed about Canada's system of politics than the system of, its, of the um, Constitution making. Because now we speak the English language. And it's not as easy for them to try and uh, weasel a way around. And this is something that we see in the record. When Lord Elgin gave instructions to Mr. Robinson in coming here to make the treaty, it says in his instructions, use coercion to gain advantage. Those words, use coercion to gain advantage, should totally invalidate the treaty and say there is no treaty. And then when we went to court and we asked the question in the court, what did we gain from the treaty? What did we gain? The answer was absolutely nothing, because we already had everything and we continue to possess everything that we had before. It hasn't gone away. We haven't lost anything. And that's what our people need to understand, what that means. What does that give us? It gives us a real, real firm presence about stature. And we need to know what that is, what it looks like. And we need our children to be able to talk about that comfortably. So when we sit with Canada, we remind Canada about where it has traveled, what it has done. And I recall going down to Six Nations in 2008 at the, at the gathering, the uh, ecumenical gathering of uh, indigenous nations, indigenous peoples from North and South America, traveled across Canada. And I sat down there and I listened to a young girl cry. And I stood up and I sat, said to this young girl, I think I have the answer that you are looking for. This, what we are having to do is hold Canada to account for what it has been doing to us as people. It's like holding the Nazis to the, at the Nuremberg war trials to crime against humanity. We have to hold Canada to the same kind of standard in terms of its behavior about what it's doing to us as the first people. So we have to, Canada has to sit down and admit 
they have a treaty with the Anishinaabek. It doesn't change the relationship that we are in, but it does require them to make some shifts about obligations so that we're not made to suffer as it's recorded in the uh, early documents. We're not going to be in need in our own house. That's what's important to understand and learn to come to know. Don't let that be taken from you. So it means that you understand what it means to be an Anishinaabek as a citizen of the Anishinaabek nation. Who is teaching you? Because certainly at school they're not showing you that and not informing you about those okay, that history. So if anything has to happen, it has to be learned at home. And sadly for some of our people a lot of that kind of story has been lost. Unfortunately within our family, within our community here, we still have a very rich history and a very strong story mm -hmm. to carry. And that's what I share with our with our family and community. Were, were, were there any thoughts that you you thought of since we were last chatting that you wanted to make sure were documented, or were you pretty satisfied with uh, what what you had shared? When we look at the ideas around the concept of our concept in relation to programming. Mm -hmm. okay. Programming can cover many kinds of activities. Say, um, development planning, physical planning, economic planning, social planning. And when you begin to take a look at what those are about, you start to get into the idea of a, a long-term program. Uh, targets that you're going to work toward in terms of being able to look at success. So within our communities we start thinking about just say the uh, aspect of a social development. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. What does that mean? When we're looking at the idea of the preservation of being in a schnabic. We have some teaching models and the teaching models are quite sophisticated, but at the same time they're very simple in terms of a diagram. But the mandate about which they uh, operate under, in terms of what they are designed to protect, is uh, really remarkable. That we had some good people that were able to take these uh, very difficult concepts about how we maintain our sense of, sense of people as being in a schnabic. We have simple diagrams, we have simple drawings to, to capture what that's about. And when we look at them today and the content of what they're carrying, we see that being a part of what's included in studies in more advanced education centers like uh, PhD programs, master's programs. Okay, the content of what um, is being carried. So when we something simple. So in education we've got a, a five-step okay, uh, activity. The circle one, put five circles in a row. The first four are, first are close together and then you get the fifth step which is offset from the first four. And you say well that's the trail of education. But there's education at the primary level the high school level, the university level, and the doctoral dissertation level. They're all captured in those okay, mm -hmm. in those circles of um, in terms of the journey. In the first level you want to go through, it's like going into the grade one. Learning to write English in one syllable words. When you learn to write in one syllable words, it's easy to relate to your world like book, tea, very simple, very direct, very okay, uh, easy to understand. But when you go up the scale in higher learning, concept like validation. Well, validation to a child doesn't mean anything, but book does. 
So we look at this education scale here, and that's what we talk about in terms of education. You've got the level of, 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 of level of abstraction increases as you go through the years of learning, and the uh, way it's laid out is it's the same at each level. The first level is awareness becoming aware of the book, becoming aware of a one-syllable word, attaching a one-syllable word with sound to give meaning. That's captured. Well, our language is structured in the same way to achieve the same outcome, but it's when you put the words, the syllables together, you begin to attach concepts to the language. So our language becomes much more complex as opposed to uh, some of the um, methods which are used in um, the English language. So when you think about say, what's occurring there, well, that's partly what we're having to come to better understand in terms of the, the ideas in relation to education. What are we teaching? How are we teaching? And they study that in concepts like uh, pedagogy or the preparation of the curriculum. In our school, okay, it's living out on the land where you're going to education, where you're going to school. So school is out on the land with somebody that's informed, that has a good cons good command of the Anishinaabek language. So when you go out there, when you travel with your grandpa, he has that kind of higher knowledge. Or if you go out there with your younger sister, uh, it's not the same. She'll teach you ideas, but she won't teach you the kinds of concepts that Grandpa can, because she doesn't have the the knowledge and the living experience yet. In time, she will. So you're always going. So education doesn't stop. It's a lifelong experience, and that's what education that we describe today about uh, the way we are uh, living. Education never stops. It's a lifelong, yes, lifelong yes, life experience. Well, we understood that. And our systems were set up to support that awareness of this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. So when we think to going down to Six Nations and say, well, people were saying, what are we? What kind of message are we going to give to the world? We said, well, we are going to say to the world that we have to hold the. Uh, colonizer to account for the behavior that has been shown to us about trying to make us make us extinct and how we are going to do that is going to take us some time but we're not going to lose sight of what the infractions were so there's an, a need there to uh, not lose sight of what the outcomes have produced. And so when we look in, look at Canada, and this is something that uh, we consider. See, when Prime Minister Harper got up in the House of Commons to apologize about the residential schools, morality says, if there was meaning in his words, the day after making the apology, there should have been a shift and a real major change in the behavior. Okay. So what did we witness? The change in the behavior was a cutting back of program dollars to support activity that was occurring within our communities. That's the sad outcome of what occurred. The apology was meaningless in terms of what the words we're showing what the behavior okay, demonstrated. So we have to go back to Canada today. It's like Cindy Blackstock taking Canada to court about uh, child welfare. The court has said you have been in violation of the rights the children and the way that they are treated their rights have been violated. You have not been providing with the care that they ought to be receiving for their 
benefit. And they are being treated as second class people. They're not being funded to the same level that other peoples receive in providing the same types of care. Why? Because they're indigenous living on a reserve? Or they're indigenous living within a city? Because they're indigenous, they get less care, less consideration? So that kind of nonsense has to stop. So people from the indigenous side can say with pride in their eyes and bring tears in their face to say that I'm a Canadian. They can't do that right now. When they see tears, it's tears of sadness, not joy. And we have to get to that, to go over those kinds of hurdles when we think about uh, where it is that we are today. I mean, we're, the, we're the first generation that can actually go to court and sue Canada for infraction. It was made illegal for our people to sue Canada. The law barred us from being able to do anything like that. It was only in 1951 where the door was opened. And now Canada's constitution has put into place another benchmark to say that it's possible to sue for rights infractions. But there's still no law which defines what rights look like in terms of what they are for Anishinaabeg people or the other indigenous nations. So what? So we have to sit down and describe what that looks like and how would you like it to be acknowledged like in the case of uh, the Tikmikshin people. What does that look like? What do we want it to mean? What do we want it to say? But that's for our people to design and, de and define. So when I wrote my letter to the Prime Minister Harper, when he didn't sign the uh, first run-through of the UNDRIP legislation and uh, proclamation, I said to him I was sad that he didn't put his signature there, but I said at the same time, his signature was not needed. I don't want his signature on a document that's international. I want to see a signature on a treaty that's made with me, protecting our community. And that's our people to decide, not some international community or not Canada you know, operating independently out away from us. They have to come here and get that approval, consent. That's the, that's the law. And that's the obligation, that's the treaty, that's the uh, way it is. But you have to feel comfortable at being able to speak like that. And it requires a lot of comfort and, uh, and education on the part of our people to understand and know that. Yeah, it, it'll be int very interesting, I think, once all this information is gathered, how, how frequently this message comes up. I'm looking forward to that time when people have gone through the recordings of what you've shared they pull out some of the common interests and common threads that have been shared in all the, uh, like I'm just one person in one region, you know, like there's about six of us in this region doing interviews and then mm -hmm. there's other regions across the land here, you know, so um, I definitely want to say thank you for, for everything you've shared for sure. There's that idea of having a shared pool of knowledge, you know, and uh, the more of us that can contribute to this, I like. That's that's why I like attaching myself to this project because mm -hmm. I feel like yeah, like there's gonna be lots of people sharing similar thoughts, similar voices into a shared pool. You know, and we can use this to to come to come to see you know many of these dreams of ours coming to fruition. You know, so uh, yeah, thanks, thanks again for for everything you've shared. Miigwech. <laughs>